at significant detail, including the money, power, and signs in the sections four, five, and six we've designated. Our narrator goes to bid adieu to Daniel and Peachy as they plan to depart from India, head to Kafiristan with a group of merchants who are leaving the bazaar. It's clear that they have a plan because Daniel is dressed as a mad priest and Peachy is a servant. They demonstrate their plan also by showing the narrator the butts of 20 martini rifles that they have purchased and intend to use to build a small army, which will be the basis of their grabbing power in Kafiristan. The narrator is impressed, but still feels like it's a fool's errand and that it's kind of a suicide mission. We have a neat little det detail here in that the narrator decides out of a kind of sentiment and maybe even um, identity attachment to these two loafers that he is going to give them a, a gift as they leave. And so he gives them what he calls a small charm compass, which is leaves us to speculate what it really means. Um, in the, the John Huston film version, it's, it is presented as a sign of Freemasonry but we have no indication that it is really here. Uh, then we have a handshake. Uh, it's the last time we'll shake hands with an Englishman these many days. Shake hands with him, Carnahan, says Daniel. <clears throat> so the handshake is, go is going to emerge as an important sign of cultural identity. It's what Englishmen do is that they shake hands with one another uh, as a kind of social contract, a kind of social alliance. So it, it, it seals a cultural identity here, and Daniel says as much, because they won't be shaking hands with the natives of Kafiristan unless or until they teach the natives the value of this English sign of social contract and social alliance. Here we find reference to an important dichotomy that's going to get played out between here this text and David Lean's Lawrence of Arabia. And that's the, no, the notion of the native mind as opposed to the British or English or European mind. Now, the native mind is imagined to be irrational. Uh, the European, British, English mind is imagined to be rational, at least by the British. They they extend their dichotomies into all sorts of categories. For example, they see themselves and their rational mind as being civilized. They see the native irrational mind, in their terms, as, as being savage. They see themselves as being light. They see the, na the natives as being dark. The, the uh, pairings uh, go on and on and on, as we'll see. But here the native mind suggests an abandonment of the rational European British English mind, which is to say an embrace of the irrational or quite simply going mad. Now, this is the point where Peachy, un unrecognizable to the narrator, drags himself back into the, the newspaper office. The narrator at first admits he doesn't recognize him until he is challenged by this stooped, uh, beaten down figure that, who says, don't you know me? He gasped, dropping into a chair. Then all of a sudden, the narrator realize, recognizes the eyebrows, a sign of Peachy, and he realizes he is talking about, he, he is talking to Peachy. Peachy Taliaferro Carnahan, he says, oh Lord. And that begins Peachy's story within a story. Now here we get a very important moment where Peachy says, I ain't mad yet, but I shall be that way soon. Of course, I remember. Keep looking at me or my words will all go to pieces. Keep looking at me in my eyes and don't say anything. Now I like to describe this as Peachy demanding 
that the narrator hold Peachy in his gaze. Look at me, he says. Now, why is that important? Peachy seems to suggest that his rational mind, his British, his English mind, his European mind, will function only with the support or prop framework of a European, British, Euro, uh, Englishman who looks at him. This testifies to the idea that this cultural identity is, is quite um, uh, amb ambiguous. It's, it's, it's constructed and it is quite arbitrary. If you look away, then my identity will disappear. I will become native. I will become irrational, he thinks, according to the European dichotomy. So he, he demands, kind of in a begging way, that the narrator keep looking at him in his eyes, but don't say anything, just keep looking at me. Peachy's admitting that he is barely rational, that he is tenuously rational, and that rationality, again, is dependent on the narrator providing the framework, the, the English, British, European framework for Peachy's rationality. So once Peachy feels like he has it, he goes back in time and he creates an episodic, a chronological narrative to explain how he and Daniel became kings and then how they they ceased to be kings and how Peachy got to the point where he is in the, the narrator's office in the newspaper room. So he begins by, by sharing what is essentially the violent strategy that they, they've decided to use. And it goes like this. Daniel and Peachy come upon a conflict in which 10 men with bows and arrows are chasing 20. They decide that they're going to come in on the side of the 10 men because they're the underdogs, they will be most grateful. So Daniel uh, and Peachy take out the Martini rifles and drop a couple of the 20 men from a significant distance, which demonstrates that they are in, in fact very, very skilled soldiers. Then they march down to the the 10 men and they, who, who uh, are intimidated and so they, they fire arrows at them. Peachy and Daniel stay out of range. Daniel fires a shot above the heads of the 10 men who realize that they are in mortal danger. They fall down to the ground. Daniel walks up to them. He kicks them. Then he lifts them up and shakes their hands all around. So what he's demonstrating is he has the power to kill them as they've killed them the 20 men, but he is going to choose not to. He's going to lift them up. He is going, he demonstrates, he teaches them the handshaking, which is meaningful because that right hand had been on the trigger of his martini rifle. So the fact that he takes his hand off the rifle and gives it to them is meaningful apart from, from any kind of language that accompanies it. It speaks loudly in and of itself. Then he gives them some of the boxes and and demonstrates how they should carry them. <clears throat> they are they lead Daniel and Peachy back to the village, where Daniel goes up to the biggest idol that he sees. He assumes that's the most powerful one because it's the biggest, and he puts a rifle, his his um, um, implement of death, and a cartridge in front of it. And then he, he rubs its nose and he demonstrates affection. This is the way he, he tries to show the natives without, again, sharing language, that he is of and from Imbra, who is their most powerful god. Then he opens his mouth. People realize he wants to be fed. They go, they go to feed him. But Daniel refuses to accept food from anyone except the person who seems to be the most important, the highest priest, and then he accepts the food. Yes, very haughty like he eats it. And in that way, he tries to demonstrate that he is connected to their most powerful god, Embra, and that they need to serve him and by association, Peachy. So what Daniel and Peachy do is they, 
they ask the members of this village, the Bashkai village, if they have enemies, and of course they do, and then they lead the, the villagers in a, a fight against the enemy. Once they, Daniel and Peachy, demonstrate their, their superiority of firepower, they ask the attacked village to surrender, saying to them through the, the Bashkai villagers, look, we can either kill all of you or you can lay down your arms, join us in an alliance, and let's go and find your next enemy and we'll attack them with a larger group. Of course, it makes perfect sense, it's very pragmatic to lay down your arms and to form this alliance. And in doing so, they defeat their enemies who in turn are asked to surrender and join and march on the next village, which you can see is a snowballing effect, or we would say nowadays it goes viral, or you could think of it as a progression of power. This is how Daniel and Peachy create an army behind them and, and use violence and force to generate control over a great number of people. We see here at the top of the page that, that there is a kind of, of sharing of language systems. Peachy and Daniel are, are going to demonstrate the handshake and they are going to share it as a sign with the natives. But they too, they're, they're, they're wise in this respect. They learn various communication techniques from, from places where they've been. So back in India, they learned how to do a string talk letter and they use those to communicate so that they don't have to be in the same place. They can actually split up the duties and that's what they do. Daniel proceeds to become the chief administrator and judge of, of the area and Peachy becomes the, the commander of their army such as it is. Now here on page 2354, we have a critically important moment. When I was introducing the concept of new historicism, and we talked about the flow of power, we explored the limits of using violence and force to create authority over subjects. It works, sure, but what happens is that there is also room for resistance, for for trying to create some ambiguity about loyalties and, and subverting the authority. So there has, to be, there has to be a more efficient means ultimately, and that more efficient means is usually ideology, which subjects then embrace and then they discipline themselves and each other according to that ideology. What happens on 2354 is that Dan has discovered that ideology, which will allow them to rule the country without using force. That ideology is Freemasonry. Going back to the beginning of this story where, where the um, narrator feels obliged to help out Peachy because they're both Freemasons. Well, what Daniel has discovered is that Billy Fish, the chief of the Bashkai, actually knows some of the Freemason grips, which means that he knows some of the, the lingo, which means he knows some of the ideas. <clears throat> they check around and apparently he's not the only one. Someone had clearly come through Kafiristan and had taught the natives uh, about Freemasonry and had essentially created a, a Freemason lodge. But that was clearly a long time ago and no one actually remembers it or remembers much more than the handshakes. So Daniel realizes that, that he has the ideological framework to, to run the country. Peachy realizes what Daniel realizes as he goes through the grips, and he realizes that they know one more grip or a higher level of Freemasonry than the natives do. So uh, they, they know something more, which they can reveal as they want to, and it makes them look godlike or divine in their knowledge. They know everything 
that the Kafiris know, plus they know something more. Now that is the basis for running a country because you're demonstrating that you already have knowledge which defines their identity. The natives wonder, how can you possibly know this? Right. So at the bottom of the page, we also see how Daniel and Peachy, they parlay this into, into more direct control. They actually rename the natives according to their own experiences as, as colonials, as imperialists. And so they give, he says, the natives names according to men they was like that we had known in India, Billy Fish, Holly uh, Wilworth, uh, Picky Kurgan, it's uh, people like that. This renaming using language as a tool to control natives is a, a very common one. In fact, it's, it's a, an essential part of uh, imposing your colonial will on a native population. You just have to admit that Peachy and Daniel are having master strokes of luck. Here's another version of it. Once they decide that they're going to run the country like a Freemason Lodge, Daniel asks the, um, the women of the Bashkai tribe to make what are essentially Freemason aprons. They're still around today. And the, they should embroider the master's mark on them, which I, I assume is, is like the, um, the compass and the square, but maybe is something else. But, but in other words, it's, it's something that is, is pretty common in Freemasonry uh, iconography. So they are, they are putting together a ritual and they're about to get started. Daniel is sitting on the chair that they, they have constructed with the stone of Embra. They brought in chiefs from out and priests from outlying areas so that, so that Daniel and Peachy can use this ritual to try and consolidate their power. All of a sudden, one of the most ancient priests freaks out. He essentially shoes Daniel off the throne, which, which Peachy thinks is a sign that he has discovered their ruse realizes that they are just men and that they are pretending and he is going to he is going to recognize that they are they've betrayed the natives and the natives are going to mutiny well that's not what happens at all the uh, old priest gets some help and they turn the stone over he he uh, cleans it off and all of a sudden he points to the sign of the the the, ma the maker's mark and uh, he, he demonstrates that the mark on the aprons is the mark uh, on the, the bottom of the stone, which makes everyone wonder how in the world could Peachy and Daniel possibly know that this ancient sign was hidden in this sacred place and secret place? Well, the answer is they must be gods. And, and Peachy and Daniel recognize immediately that this is, this is how they need to play it. So Daniel says, and this is very important, he says, by virtue of the authority vested in my own right hand. So notice how, how Daniel has nothing more. He, he can't refer to their gods. He can't refer to the will of the people. He takes power by force and by luck. And he admits as much when he says, by virtue of my own right hand, right? <clears throat> The last thing on this page is now we have yet another one of these references to Mohammedans. Now the Kafiris are, and Kafiristan is Kafiristan because Kafir means infidel and, and these people are infidels because they refuse to allow in or to uh, um, uh, Mohammedans and they refuse to accept Islam. They keep their native gods like Imbra. But Daniel decides that what he's going to do is he, he is going to demonize these Mohammedans and he, he is going to see them as the ultimate enemy. He also, notice, pairs this with blackness, which he opposes to what he, he thinks of as the whiteness of the Kafiris, <coughs> who must have been more like folks from the Caucasus, hence Caucasian and he, whom he and Peachy like to think of as English, their people, because they think of white 
as not only a race, but a race that has a nationality, and that nationality is English. So Daniel continues with this idea of black versus white, Mohammedan versus, versus um, you know, Christian or um, at, at least non-Mohammedan. But here we have a very significant uh, and sad, of course, moment in the text when Daniel gets all excited and then he uses the objectionable N-word. Now, in a way, um, Kipling does us a favor because it, it causes us to realize how objectionable Daniel and Peachy must be. We are going to be in, encouraged to forget about this at the end, but, but obviously we all want to remember this. This is going to be one of the most important moments in the text. Now, our new historical training is going to allow us to think about the values of colonialism and how they they impose themselves upon this part in the world of the world without falling into the trap of anachronism which is to say to impose our values on a time when those values didn't really exist now that's not the issue the text is alive at this moment it exists in the eternal present along with us the readers and we see this word and we recognize what the project that Daniel and Peachy are involved in, which is a colonial project. And we should feel that we have the right to judge this colonial, this imperial project based on the, um, the views of the races that Daniel and Peachy uh, engage in. Aside from that, we have to wonder, okay, is this text that, that Kipling presents us, is it fundamentally racist? And should it be in our curriculum? That's a conversation that we're going to need to have as well. Now, Daniel gives us a very revealing moment when he imagines to Peachy the end game, in other words, the ultimate goal that they want to achieve. And he, he thinks, you know what, we can build an empire here. There's no stopping us and we'll get it organized and it will be all ship shape, he thinks. And when it's all ship shape, we'll hand it over to Queen Victoria and she will she will say, rise, uh, rise up Sir Daniel Dravet. And then he says, oh, it's big, I tell you, it's big. Well he reveals to us exactly what his motivation, and we assume Peachy's motivation was from the very beginning, which was not to be kings of Kafiristan or gods or emperors, rich per se. They wanted those things, but as a means to an end, not in it, an end in themselves. The, the means is becoming kings of Kafiristan. The end is to trade it for knighthoods in England. So it becomes eminently clear to all of us that what Daniel and Peachy wanted is the very thing that you can't have if you stay in, in England, in Britain, and that is social mobility. They wanted to move up from being just, you know, loafers to being nobility. But that's not, Kate, you're not allowed to do that. That's not a possibility in Britain. You have to go away and you have to you have to discover you have to uh, gain possession of something so important to Queen Elizabeth to the Empire that they will reward you that the ex the existing authority in Britain will reward you and call you worthy and that's what they ultimately really want okay but no sooner does Daniel reveal this then he, he sort of tips over his rational self and he becomes irrational. He decides he's powerful enough to do whatever he wants and what he wants is to have a wife. Of course, this goes against the contract and Peachy points that out, but, but Daniel responds by nitpicking the contract. Well, the contract was only in effect only as long as as we were trying to become kings of Kafiristan and now we are kings of Kafiristan so the contract clearly doesn't uh, doesn't exist anymore and we don't need to be bound by it 
of course, here's another example of Peachy and Daniel thinking that the Kafiris aren't aren't like the what he calls the Black Mohammedans, but are in fact uh, white English people. At the moment of greatest power, when Daniel uh, dictates that he is going to have a wife, the bride to be who is horrified at the thought of being married to a god, because it's like trying to feed 220 voltage into a 110, um, you know, hairdryer. It's going to burn up. <clears throat> she knows this. And so she turns into Daniel's neck and bites him, at which point he yells at her and he touches his neck and sees that, that he is bleeding. He doesn't quite get it at first, but this is a sign, and the sign to the natives is that Daniel, and by association Peachy, cannot be gods because gods do not bleed. Only men bleed. Daniel and Peachy are men. They are not gods. They, therefore, these two men have been, have been lording it over them and have been... Uh, dominating them under false pretenses. According to Peachy's version, Daniel doesn't quite get it. He is angry, and all of a sudden, the, uh, the natives start to, to rustle and move about and, and uh, essentially rebel. Daniel still doesn't get it. He gets mad, and he, he stomps around. An emperor am I, says Daniel. And next year I shall be knight of the queen. Again, he doesn't realize the, the uh, danger that they are in. He turns to Peachy and, and he commits the mortal sin of a, of a gentleman. He, he casts blame. It's your fault, he says, for not looking after your army better. So he attacks Peachy rather than owning the blame. He's the one, after all, who broke the contract if, if he had kept to the contract as as he had signed originally and as Peachy reminded him of page or so earlier, then they probably would have been fine. No telling what they could have gotten away with. Well, as they try to make their break for it, Daniel finally comes to his senses and, and realizes what's been going on. He he also understands that that they're not going to escape ultimately and he wants to take responsibility and see if he can sacrifice himself for his friend and for, for Billy Fish, who has shown loyalty to him. And so he says, he says it's, um, it's, his, uh, it's I brought you to this nonsense. I brought you to this. Get back, Billy Fish, and take your men. You've done what you could, now cut for it. Carnahan, he says, shake hands with me and go along with Billy. So what we see is the, the handshake sign again here, once again, is a sign of social alliance, but a sign of respect and sincerity that Daniel is offering. Well, uh, all to no avail because both Billy Fish and Peachy stand by him, even though he, um, he misbehaves. They are all captured. They spend all of their ammunition. Billy Fish's throat is cut. Um, in a, uh, an act of trying to to protect Daniel and Peachy. Peachy and Daniel are captured. They march Peachy and Daniel to one of the, the engineering feats they've accomplished, a rope bridge across a ravine, and they, they prod Daniel out to the middle of it. Once he's out in the middle and the natives are off of the bridge, they are going to cut it and let him fall hundreds of feet to his death. But the, the king, Daniel, uh, objects to the, the way that they are prodding him as if he can't walk with dignity out onto the middle of the bridge himself. He says, damn your eyes, says the king, do you suppose I can't die like a gentleman? Well, this is important because in his last act, Dan, Daniel is trying to be the gentleman that he wanted the king or, or the queen to confer uh, upon him, the 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 status that he wanted conferred upon him. So at this moment, we realize that 
this status is something that you can actually confer upon yourself if you, in the face of death, act in a certain way. Now, this will, will perhaps remind us of another text that Kipling has written, If, which we can take a look at. Uh, but here he, he acts like a gentleman, and I guess the idea is he fakes it until he makes it. Um, Peachy admits that he is weeping here at the end of Daniel's life and their friendship. Daniel turns to him and owns his, his mistake. He offers a legitimate, a real apology where he takes responsibility. He explains what he did wrong. He asks for forgiveness and he asks to have his, his hand shaken by, by Peachy. Shake hands. So there's that sign again. Peachy shares that, that um, Daniel tries to get, gain control by, by commanding that the natives cut as if, as if they weren't going to anyway, and as if he were the one in his last act of, as king who was, who was giving the command. They don't care. The natives don't care. They cut anyway. Daniel spirals down to the bottom of the ravine where he, he clearly dies. The story ends and Peachy starts to, to wander into irrationality. He starts saying things that don't make sense, which, which, makes, the, the, which makes the narrator wonder if in fact he can trust Peachy's story. So we as readers of the narrator's story must wonder, like the narrator, can we trust the story that Peachy has told? How can we trust it? So like the narrator, we're looking for a sign that we can trust the narrative. Peachy has already thought about this. So he reaches in a little bag that's tied onto his belt, opens it up, and he pulls out the head of Daniel Dravet with a, a, a gold ringlet crown with turquoises on it. Now, how do we know it's the head of Daniel Dravet? Because this severed head has a red beard on it. The red beard, like the eyebrows, identify this character. The eyebrows identify Peachy, the red beard identifies Daniel Dravet. That's good enough for our narrator. So he accepts what he thinks of as the truth of Peachy's narrative, even though it breaks down at time and uh, Peachy loses, loses touch with himself and he, he even presents himself in the third person. We realize that Peachy has, has been on a mission. After surviving the crucifixion miraculously and being released by the Bash or, or by the Bashkai and by the Kafiris, he wanders all the way back to India, which must have been uh, a titanic sort of struggle, an epic struggle, so that he can sit in this newspaper office with this narrator and tell this story. That's his mission, clearly. He wants to tell the story to someone who will retell the story and amplify it so that Daniel and his experience will get a larger audience. That's all he wants and he needs it to be taken seriously. So he has severed the head of Daniel and he has brought it back uh, for just this purpose to, to demonstrate the veracity of his story. We get this, this um, little hymn that, it, that Peachy sings and we wonder what is this supposed to mean in the context of the story? So we are left with this plus our mind will inevitably run back to the first paragraph where the moral of the story, at least the moral that the narrator takes, is that his king is dead. He will not be given a kingdom. If he wants a kingdom, he must go and look for it himself. We're left wondering what that means as well. So the, the meaning of the story as Kipling presents it to us, is one of trying to understand 
how you how you create and achieve and realize your own worthiness. But for the rest of us who are reading this, we must we must wonder about the strategies that these Englishmen, these Anglo Indians are willing to adopt to achieve this sense of worthiness and what the cost is for the natives who, who receive much less consideration than Peachy and Daniel do here, at least in terms of their value as human beings. So we want to try and understand what Kipling is doing, but we also want to give ourselves permission to value and judge what we think Kipling is doing. Thanks.